in the book of Matthew, Jesus rides into Jerusalem triumphant. The people see him as king and lay down their cloaks in the road and shout, Hosanna in the highest. Jesus is seen as a prophet from Galilee. He then moves from the streets of Jerusalem to the temple to eradicate the den of robbers selling in the temple courts, then is confronted and questioned by Jewish authorities. It feels scary and turbulent and a bit unnerving. Yet through the turmoil and the uncertainty, Jesus does not stop teaching and proclaiming. Proclaiming the right way to live. Proclaiming that the Son of Man is near, is right here. And proclaiming that there will be hard times coming. There are parables still to be told. And there are still some Jewish Sadducees and Pharisees to confront, revealing their intent and wickedness. And then perhaps the greatest moment of all after he rides triumphant into Jerusalem is when Jesus gives to his disciples and all who listen the words of the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus doesn't just stop teaching and guiding and shepherding even when he knows his time is near. Jesus predicts the persecutions, adds a few more lessons, more parables, and then is anointed by a woman from Bethany. Anointed. He's anointed, friends. Jesus is going to die soon. So he shares a simple meal with his disciples for Passover. He shares the bread and the cup with them and tells them that some of them will betray him. They'll betray him for money or deny that they ever even knew him. When they share the bread and the cup for their Passover meal, Jesus knows that the flesh is weak and that the men with whom he shared everything will scatter as they will be afraid when their rabbi is taken away. These disciples need to walk away, to walk by, to deny that they knew him. They will be too overwhelmed to do anything else. But how does a man go from being a kingly presence adored by all, riding into a religious city one minute, to being an outlaw and one to whom the same crowd yells, crucify him, in the next minute? Because friends, it's actually quite easy to betray and walk by our Lord and Savior. Last week when I was helping one of our congregants at a local funeral home, I had an experience that still haunts me. When we finished the business of the funeral home, we were all walking out when a woman approached me directly. She was wearing ski pants, a ski coat, wasn't that cold, dirty, torn clothing. Her hair was matted, she was visibly dirty. And she walked up to me and said, do you have a dollar you could spare? I'm sorry, I said. I don't have any cash money on me, and usually I have granola bars. I don't have that purse today. I'm so sorry. If I did, I would give you one. Then she turned to my congregants' family and was going to speak to them when a man came out of the funeral home and yelled, Hey, you, get out of here. I told you you can't panhandle here. Go away. Get lost. The woman turned and quickly left. I continued with my congregant to her car and said my goodbyes. This scenario haunts me. I've gone over my head a thousand times. I was distracted. I was engaged with the family. They had just lost a loved one. I wasn't on my game. But no one, no one has the right to talk to a human being that way like they were a dog. And I should have stopped and done something about it. I'm a pastor, that's my role. I was distracted by caring for another when I could have been caring for all. So I've been living with that for a week or so, and now I'm going to do something about it. We have a visitor today, Jennifer Geist, the executive director of First Stop. It's a homeless ministry. First Stop's mission is to encounter the homeless where they are and to connect them to critical services and support and empower them toward independent and sustainable living. Jennifer, would you come up? Thanks for being here today. See if we can get your microphone aligned with your voice there. So glad you're here. 
that's perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank well, you I'm for glad. sharing that. Yeah, and you heard my story. Yes. Um, I suppose it's not unheard of, you know, that a business dealing with someone who's homeless in this type of situation, they could get angry. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Can you all hear me okay? A um, little louder? A little louder there, or closer. There, you there go. we go. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yes, I would say... Uh, thankfully, most of the businesses that we interact with are fairly compassionate and want to help, but they don't know how to do it. But right. that does happen. Um, and, you know, I feel for the business owner because he probably or she was worried about all of you. They were. Like, yeah. I feel for my customers. I'm not sure if that's what you call people that come to your funeral home, but I'm, I'm sure that was the intention, but um, yes, things like that. And, and probably somebody here, including myself, have had experiences like that where, you know, we're not always acting the way we know we're supposed to be. So, right. Yeah. Well, when I got home, you know, I realized I could have called you guys first stop and asked that you talk to the funeral home or and educate them. Or I could have called you and asked you to educate me on what I should have done, particularly if that person has been making repeat visits. Would that have been a good idea? Well, and I would say it for the first part of that, we do um, have businesses. So we're located right in downtown Huntsville. Um, we have businesses that reach out to us. I've got an outreach team that is going out into the camps every day, and they do go to businesses. And so what we usually tell business owners is, unless this person is truly b breaking the law um, or some t appears to be a threat to you, if they're just hanging around and they don't look very pleasant, as you described, you know, that's not a crime, you know. And so we say call us because we probably know who they are and we can get them the services that they need. Um, we have talked to business owners and educated because I think a lot of times – uh, somebody who is homeless is sort of scary, right? Like, do you guys feel that way? Mm -hmm. you, they're you. Th I don't know what we think, but we have these stereotypes, and there's a reason sometimes stereotypes form. But many of them have an addiction issue or a mental health issue, and it is scary. And so, I think the more people can learn, mm -hmm. and I also say I find the people who have experienced a loved one that has a severe addiction. Or a mental health issue, um, raise your hand if you know somebody or have a loved one that has an addiction or a severe mental health issue. Yeah. Okay. Some of you do, but you're not raising your hands, and that's okay. Um, so it's just real. It's the real world, and this is just a group of people that have nobody. Um, and that's what I've said before when I've spoken with Pastor Kim, As I said, if you're living in a tent in the woods in Huntsville, you've got nobody to go to to help you. You don't have a couch. You don't have a friend. Your mama probably doesn't like you anymore. I mean, that's what we're dealing with. So um, we are there to help educate individuals and businesses. Well, mm -hmm. and I confess that it can be easy to walk by. And I, I think yes. that sometimes it's easy to walk by, even those homeless camps in Huntsville. I think one of the reasons why we can walk by so easily is because our heads are so distracted. Like we are so distracted and it takes mm -hmm. up time, which is terrible, to stop and think about it. And the other reason, frankly, is because I'm not sure we want to engage our brains right now in this plight because there's so much violence. Look at the shootings yeah. that have just happened. Yeah. There's hatred in the world. There, there's a lot of confusing rhetoric. It's easier sometimes to walk by. It's like our psyches maybe can't handle one more thing, one more shooting, yeah. one more sex trafficking incident and one more homeless person. And this makes me sad. So how does your organization help the homeless without being completely depressed at the end of the day when the situation seems so hopeless? Yeah, that's such a great point. I think especially when you say the term hopeless, because I, I think that we have a team of people that are very hope filled because yes. we believe that people can change whether they're changing be from the power of God, whether they're changing from a really skilled uh, social worker that knows how to get them the resources they need or a drug and alcohol counselor. But 
I think as soon as we stop caring about people or believe that somebody is hopeless or their circumstance is hopeless, they need to go home. Like this isn't the right place to be. Um, But the reason I would say that we don't get depressed and don't get me wrong, it is hard. It's very hard. Um, But I think it's because we see changes. And so there's, you know, like last year and we had 55 people that we helped move from a tent into an apartment or a home and we walked that journey with them so to be able to see somebody who looks maybe like what you described to then walking into our office and now they're in their own apartment and they're self-sufficient and you can have a conversation with them because they're mentally stable now and they're not high you know it's a different world and so we keep going for those we keep going because every single life change is important to us yes Yes. And, you know, Jesus taught us so many lessons. And the two that come to mind right now, of course, are love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And when you do for the least of these, you do for me. And Big Cove Presbyterian here has been raising money during Lent to give to First Stop, our little boxes, right, Mm -hmm. to help with the mission. But sending money doesn't always help us to be aware of how we can help in our everyday lives, like in our comings and in our goings. Jesus asked us as disciples to love his neighbors, but it seems a little bit hard to do with the homeless. I confess that. Now, Ralph and I did what you suggested. We drove by the homeless camp in Huntsville. We were literally, friends, viscerally affected. Like, our stomachs hurt. And, and, and it was like entering another world, a really bad one. Yeah. So what are the simple ways that we can feel as though we're making a difference, like being a Christ light in our community in relationship to the homeless situation? That's great. Thank you. I would say your prayers are so important. Um, I'm always looking for church partners that are willing to pray for our homeless community. And I would say, you know, they need your prayers, but I also think it's good for each of us because we all come to this uh, Um, idea of somebody being homeless with lots of other uh, judgments that we have. I work, not I work, my parents are individuals who um, don't really value social justice. Um, They sort of feel like I've heard them say things kind of like, well, you know, can they just get a job or like they don't understand it. And so I've asked them because I feel like you need to pray for these individuals because you got to soften your heart as well. So if you've got any of your own issues you're working through, I would say pray for the individuals. But the other thing I want to say, and it's back to Kim as well, is it's okay if you have a little blip and you you're not as gracious as you should be. God knows your heart. And, you know, we all have days where we're distracted. I mean, no matter what, you may not, you may see each other and not greet them. You might run into each other at Walmart and forget to say hello to somebody here at church. It happens. Um, I would say we have had some of our staff members have our, some of our homeless clients say to them, thank you for looking me in the eye and treating me like I am an individual and I'm a person. And so I've never had to say that to anybody in my life. I've never had to speak the words like, Kim, thank you for recognizing that I'm here. So if somebody says that, that's because people aren't doing that. They're not recognizing them. So, you know, just imagine if you run into somebody homeless that this could be your child. This could be your sibling, your parent. It, it, It could be, and it might be, and we don't know what that person's going through. Um, so I say your prayers first. I would also say when you asked about other ways you could help, if you want to be able to help and give back, we do have opportunities for you to volunteer. So we have a website with a volunteer link. Um, you would never be alone. You would be in our day center with lots of our staff, but you could get a chance to just interact and and spend time. I think the unknown is scary. And I came from the corporate world. I worked um, at Teledyne Brown Engineering, got called to do this work. Um, And so I think for a lot of people, the unknown is scary. But if you came and you volunteered and you just realized that you're just talking to a regular person that it's just like you or I, it would, it would be good for you. So I think so, yeah. too. Um, when Ralph and I recently were at the courthouse, there was a woman there who really had some mental health issues, and she was crying hysterically, y'all. And, and the police officers just didn't know what to do. They were really having a difficult time, and I didn't know what to do either. But what I did is I went over to her and I asked her, can I pray for you? Mm. I put my hands on her. I said, may I touch you? I always ask, yeah. may I touch you? 
and then I prayed with her and she just she calmed down a bit Mm -hmm. and then of course the situation escalated I had to leave because the police became involved but just the simple act of praying with her Mm -hmm. de-escalated her tremendously and that's really she was a human being yes yes she was a human being it's so important well, yes. I can't thank you enough thank for coming you. here today and sharing your insights. I think it will help us all remember that our mission and outreach team, too, is making plans to be able to engage as, as partners with First Stop. And, but just having you here and thank understanding you. our plight is yes. really helpful. Yes, thank, you, thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate the time and all of your support. So thank, thank you. you. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. Friends, that night... That Passover night, only days after they were waving the palm branches and shouting Hosanna and the highest, Jesus knew what was about to happen. He told them that they would scatter, that they would betray him, that his brother and sister disciples would not stand up for him when the time came for him to be hauled away. So he did what he knew to do for them. He once again taught them something. He gave them a comforting memory and a practice for them to hold on to.